want to begin before I get completely started. I'd like to say a few things. Thank you, Pastor and Brother Philip, for this great opportunity. It's not often that I get to um, preach. This is only my third or fourth time now. Um, so I've got all kind of things to say. But um, I'll just say this. Um, Pastor, thank you for setting my mind at ease about this pulpit. I saw it this morning. I'm like, maybe they didn't want us younger ones to just beat up the nice one. <laughs> um, lastly, uh, Bar Philip, Johnny and I agreed before uh, we came up that if we get out early, you get the credit. If we get out late, it's your fault. So, um, I'd like you to please open your Bibles to Romans uh, chapter 6, verse number 6. And I'll begin tonight with a little bit of my testimony. Um, in November of 2006, I was born to Jeremy and Jennifer Hopkins in Greenville, North Carolina. Most of my early years um, were spent at Liberty Field Baptist Church where my granddaddy pastored for many years. In my time there, I learned of the foundation on which the faith of my parents and my grandparents stood. On a moment, on a Monday night in October of 2012, I received Jesus as my Lord and Savior. From then on, I was still this mischievous little blonde-haired son of Brother Jamie and Miss Jennifer in our church, but I had just found a new source of incredible joy and happiness in my life. Life continued, and I lived with a constant joy and a bright smile on my face. This lifestyle continued um, pretty much till the fall of 2019. Um, in, in that fall, um, I was confronted with a great spiritual battle and Satan gained an upper hand in my spiritual life at the time. Uh, he used my personal curiosity and lured me into a certain addiction, but thankfully with God's help and spiritual counselors, I was able to take a hold of that. Um, that's what I'm going to talk about tonight. This is a new topic for this young preacher, but I think it's applicable to all Christians. We all have to fight addictions. Um, whether you have had them or not, it's sad and it's sadly true that we don't really, even Christians, don't go through life without having addictions. It's just part of our human flesh. Um, as Christians, we have the power to fight these addictions with God's help. So, um, if you're taking notes tonight, I've entitled my thought, um, or God's thought rather, Out with the Old, In with the New. This world is covered with all kinds of people, young and old, who are addicted to all sorts of different things. The top ten addictions in the world are caffeine, tobacco, and nicotine, Alcohol, sexual addictions, illegal and prescription drugs, gambling, the internet and modern technologies, video games, food, and work. While some of these may sound a little amusing, each of these is quite real and dangerous in their entirety. We as Christians shouldn't have to deal with these addictions because we should always be filled with the Holy Spirit. Um, we Sometimes, however, we're very similar to the nation of Israel. Um, even after they'd shortly been traveling um, from their exodus from Egypt, they started complaining to Moses, why did you bring us here into the wilderness? We, you could have left us in Egypt and we'd have been just fine. They had figs and pomegranates and melons. Our life was so much better there. They had already forgotten that they were slaves. That's where we were before Jesus got to us, before we let him come into our lives. Galatians uh, 4.9 says, But now, after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements, whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage? We, as Christians, have this battle because Satan knows we are God's, we are God's tools in this world. He knows that if he can stop us, he can severely limit how much, how many people hear about God and how many 
will surrender to his calling on their lives. So I'm going to be in several passages this evening, um, so be ready for a little bit of Bible walking. But um, if you're already in Romans, as I said, we'll start in verse 6. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead, and, for he that is, dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let no sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you. For ye are not under the law, but under grace. So I think it's very appropriate, I'll begin with saying, I think it's very appropriate, um, the translator's word choice in verse 7. For he that is dead is freed from sin. I did a little bit of extra study um, on this particular verse um, with the idea of being freed from addiction. This is the only time in the entire Bible where the specific word freed is used. There's no other time, Old or New Testament, where it's used. It's usually used in the context of justify, um, justified, justifieth, all those, but in this instance, I think it's really appropriate because I think of two literally identical passages in Matthew and Luke that say, no man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. He cannot serve God and mammon. So as Christians, when we chose Christ, we were freed from our old master of sin. Verse 7 is the only, like I said, is the only place um, where the word freed is used. In throwing off the old body of sin, we are no longer under the power or control of sin and its abilities. Um, as it says in verse 9, um, death hath no more dominion over you. But, um, excuse me, thus, we should no longer lend ourselves to the usage of our bodies and minds for the work of evil, Paul said later in the verses, um, don't let your bodies be used as instruments of unrighteousness, but used for righteousness as unto God. Um, after we've thrown off the old body, we must throw off the deeds of our old flesh. In Ephesians um, 4, if you will please turn there with me. Ephesians 4 verses 21 and 22. It says... If so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. So there's a similar passage in Colossians 3, uh, verses 8 and 9, where it says, But now ye also put off all these and anger, Wrath, malice, blasphemy, filth, communication, out of your mouth. So when we accept Jesus Christ, we throw off the old man. But not only do we have to throw off the old man, it said earlier, throw off the old man with his deeds. Our evil thoughts, evil communication, evil um, works, um, where we go, how we do things, all of it can be evil, but with God all things are possible, and with Him those can all be turned to His glory. Amen. So with that, um, I just said we're given in those two um, passages a couple of lists of what to throw out. Um, in this one specifically, um, mm, yeah, uh, anger, malice. And all this evil us, but I don't believe I don't believe one can just stop having succumbed to an addiction. I don't think Paul believed it either. 
Because each time he said to throw off the old man, he said to put on a new man. So in getting rid of the old man, you must then replace it with um, a better relationship with God. You must then pursue a more um, relationship with him and personal time with him. And um, in the two passages we just read, uh, Ephesians 4, 23 and 24, it says, And be renewed in the spirit of your mind, that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. And then in the Colossians 3 passage, um, it says in verse 10, And have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image that, of him that created him. Don't think you can replace your sin or your struggle with a worldly thing. Don't think you can just say, oh, I, I won't do this anymore. I'll, I'll just listen to music. I'll, do, I'll, I'll read a book. I'll watch a movie, whatever. That's not how it works. God's the only one that can actually help you. So why are you pushing him off? Why aren't you letting him in your personal space? Like some of the testimonies said, um, there's a song that I have grown to love or not love, appreciate because of how it applies to my life. I was one that was pushing him off. I was one that was not letting him work in my life as I should. I was keeping Jesus at a distance. I was, I was the, the song goes, close enough to feel the warmth of the fire, far enough away for me to hide. It, it hit me that, why? Why should we as Christians be ashamed when he says, come to me? Why should we hide from him when he specifically says, lay your care upon me, for I care for you? Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart, and you shall find rest for your soul. So, don't just find something to put in there. Spend time with him. Spend time in prayer. Don't just ask him for things and tell him how things are going in your life. Listen for a response. He said to the wind and waves, peace, be still. He said to us, be still and know that I am God. That's right. So in uh, Romans 13, if you will, please turn there with me real quick. In Romans 13, verses 11 through 14, it says, And that knowing the time, and that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in riding and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. First thing he said, wake up. The sins and addictions in our lives will put us to sleep spiritually. We won't be able to see the traps that Satan puts before us if we're already in another. We won't be able to see what's down the road if we're stuck where we are. He says to wake up. Secondly, he says to armor up. He says put on the Lord Jesus Christ. So all of us are very aware of the Ephesians 6 passage of the armor of God. I'm just going to go through that real quick. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the, the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, 
having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. I went all the way through that list, and a lot of people see... Um, the armor as all defensive and the sword is the only offensive. Not true. Prayer is our greatest communication with God. He's given us his word that we may hear what he's already said to us, not what he will say, eh, more or less. But um, his word is the greatest way to fight the devil but in comparison to God, we got nothing. He, he's, the, he's the greatest power to ever have existed or ever will exist because he's the end and the beginning. He's the Alpha and Omega. He's where we get our power. This, he's the only reason this has any power. Otherwise, we just read it like any other book. Go on with our life. Maybe get a short little lesson. Okay, sure. Uh... If we read a fitness book, maybe diet a little. Uh, if we read a um, technologies book, maybe know how to work a computer or a phone or whatever. This tells us how to live life. It tells us how to fight the devil. It tells us to pray. If we ask God to fight for us, we have nothing to worry about. He will help us fight our addictions. He will help us fight our struggles. He will help us go on and press forward to the mark. So I'll end with this. If you're dealing with a certain addiction or struggle and you're wondering how to fight it, throw off that old man that's trying to pull you down. Throw off that, kick out that old flesh that's creeped in the back door. Spend even more time with God in his word and in one prayer with him and one-on-one -on -one prayer with him. And if you say you don't have time, make time. Your spiritual life is far too important to neglect for daily life. God has set you free, so don't let Satan tell you otherwise. God's got you and he will help you in your situation. One last passage I'd like to turn to. John 8 verses 32 and 36. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. Amen. Thank you all for your time. We'll end in a word of prayer, and John, you'll come up. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for your grace and mercy. I thank you for the power you've given us in your word. I thank you for your help in overcoming our life's battles. I thank you for helping us overcome our certain addictions and struggles. I pray that you'd help us all lean on you more. Please help us to realize that our power is in you and that Satan can do nothing against you. I pray that you'd please bless Johnny and Brother Philip as they come up next. And in your name I pray. Amen.